lazy days of summer have arrived, and with them, the opportunity to travel and see new places. Maybe you're headed abroad to Paris, the City of Lights, and home of the 2024 Olympics. Or perhaps your journeys are taking you south of the equator to Peru for an epic hike to Machu Picchu, or to Bolivia to see the salt flats of Uni. Or maybe like us, you're finding your travels are closer to home on the trails of a national park, like Mount Rainier, Shenandoah, or Yosemite. From hikes to hotels to the best spots to eat, Moon Travel has you covered. From excellent first-hand experience from authors who are local to the areas they are writing about, to wonderful maps and great recommendations, Moon Travel Guides give the reader so much more than other travel guides on the market. That's right, and we are so excited that this year we are again partnering with Moon Travel. Through this partnership, through the end of 2024, our listeners can get 20% off any Moon Travel Guide when they use the code GAZE24 at checkout. That's code GAZE24, G-A-Z-E-2-4, for 20% off any Moon Travel Guide in Moon's entire library, and you actually will not find this deal anywhere else, everybody. Head to our show notes to check it out and see Moon's entire collection of guidebooks. So ready to cross something off your travel bucket list in 2024? Have a lot of great ideas for trips, but don't know how to get started or keep your itinerary organized? Wherever your wanderings may take you or inspire Inspire you to go. Moon Travel Guides have you covered. Head to moon.com and use code GAZE24 at checkout to open up the world of possibilities for your next trip. Moon Travel, let your heart be your compass, let Moon be your guide. I think when you think national parks, you know, you think family trips uh, for sure. I know growing up, again, when you're really poor and young and brown and you know you're different you don't think the national parks are for you i always thought you had to have like a station wagon to go and we didn't have a station wagon um but i think for most of america when you think national parks are like family trip uh we're no different we want families to come to visit the stonewall national monument we want families to come visit the stonewall national monument visitor center we are no different from any of the other national parks or monuments or visitor centers in that regard this is a place where you can come learn about what happened there and it's part of american history it's not just lgbtq history we are a part of american history so it was interesting we were just on a call before uh with the wonderful folks from the npca and that's where we are constantly talking about that we are a destination for families Hello and welcome to Pride Mix here at Gaze at the National Parks, the podcast. June is LGBTQIA plus Pride Month, and during the month of June, our Trail Mix episodes are called Pride Mixes. Pride Mix is a chance for us to dive deep into queer history, and in some cases, how queer history intersects with the National Parks and the National Parks Service's role as America's storyteller. While in our Pride Mix episodes from season two and three, we turned our focus on events and people in history, specifically in New York and San Francisco, to help illuminate the contributions of queer POC individuals in the LGBTQIA plus movement, in the last two years, we've turned our focus on laws which have been enacted against the LGBTQIA plus community. From don't say gay legislation to anti-trans bills, the laws of the last several years, and the rhetoric of conservative lawmakers that drive them, the United States has certainly regressed in the treatment of the LGBTQIA plus community. While these issues by no means are resolved, we want to turn our lens yet again for our Pride Mix episodes this year. This year, we're focusing on queer individuals within the community and organizations whose work is having a direct impact on outdoor spaces, the national parks, and the LGBTQIA plus community. This year marks a very special year as it is the 55th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising, a monumental moment for the history and liberation of queer people in America. In 2016, the Stonewall Inn was designated a national monument. This year, on June 28, 2024, in the space next door to Stonewall Inn, a space that was also part of the original bar, the Stonewall Inn National Monument Visitor Center will be open to the public. The Stonewall National Monument Visitor Center is a program of Pride Live in partnership with the National Park Service. Founded in 2012, Pride Live is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to accelerating awareness and support for the LGBTQIA plus community 
community via social advocacy and community engagement to advance the fight for full equality. From working with the most marginalized and underrepresented organizations to supporting the effort leading up to the declaration of the Stonewall National Monument and to conceptualizing and developing Stonewall Day, a benefit concert to elevate and boost awareness of the Stonewall Rebellion and LGBTQIA plus activism. Pride Live works in service of the LGBTQIA plus community. To learn more about Pride Live, visit www.pridelive.org. We had the distinct honor of being able to sit down and chat with Diana Rodriguez, the CEO and one of the co-founders of Pride Live. Diana's activism has lifted LGBTQIA plus visibility to new heights, showcased in Pride Live's milestone achievements such as advocating for the most marginalized LGBTQIA plus organizations, leading support on the declaration of the Stonewall National Monument, and the creation of Stonewall Day, an annual benefit concert to boost awareness of the Stonewall Rebellion and connect that legacy to today's generations. Diana spearheaded the effort to establish the Stonewall National Monument Visitor Center, the first LGBTQIA plus visitor center within the National Park Service, raising over $3.2 million to date for the project. Over the span of her career, Diana has raised over $60 million. She previously served on the development team at the Clinton Foundation, was executive producer of the GLAAD Media Awards, and was the director of event management and public relations for the Jackie Robinson Foundation. With Diana, we were able to chat about the upcoming opening of the Stonewall National Monument Visitors Center, the intersection of queer history and the national parks, and what it looks like to preserve queer history and queer stories. Diana, we would like to welcome you to the show. We are so excited to get to chat with you today because you have such a very, very special connection to one of our newest national monuments and its story and also how the community is involved in preserving its story and making sure that the story has the life and attention that it deserves. You do a lot of that work with the organization called Pride Live. And we were wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what Pride Life is, what kind of work Pride Life does, and also who you are and how you work with Pride Life. So sure, first, it's amazing to be doing this. I believe this is my first one. I've somehow gotten away for 30 years without doing a lot of press. But this is my first interview like this. So I want to thank you guys for inviting me. Uh, thank you very much for that. So I am the founder of Pride Live. I've only ever worked in not-for-profit, been 32 years now. So I started out at Jackie Robinson Foundation, and then I ran the Glide Media Awards for six years, uh, and then I was at the Clinton Foundation. And it was when I was there that a small team and I, we decided we would try and do something on our own and create Pride Live. You know, I wasn't that young, but I realized that I maybe should have had a bit more (laughs) planning in mind um, because I think our original mission statement was to help the community. Like that's how basic it was. The first couple of years out with Pride Live, we were supporting other organizations. So we raised money or helped them produce events or helped with development practices and policies or board development. So that was fine like the Tyler Clemente Foundation and Trevor Project. And then I remember one of our board meetings, I think year three or four, the board said, you know, we're really good at what we do. We should do our own thing. And so that's where our Stonewall Day concert came into place. And Stonewall has just, like many, Stonewall has just always had this very significant place in my existence. I think when you're growing up, I'm 58. And I so I grew up in a time where you really didn't talk about being gay. You really questioned who you were. You really questioned as a kid if there was a place for you, if you would find love. So I think Stonewall was kind of like that beacon. I couldn't research it. There was no internet back then. There was no, you know, the libraries maybe had two books in the section where you weren't supposed to go. So I think Stonewall kind of always had just this really special place in my heart. So we said, well, we'll create this concert because music always, as Madonna says, music brings the people together. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes. We started uh, Stonewall Day concert. And I remember the first one was a really small reception that Chelsea Clinton hosted for us. Then we just accelerated really quickly with the concert, you guys. The focus of the concert was to elevate awareness for Stonewall, like the legacy. It had been four or five decades and things just happen and change really quickly. So we said, well, if we remind people, even if it's just once a year, hey, focus on Stonewall and remember what the people who came before us did for us. And again, to bring people together through music. So that's how Stonewall Day started. And then it just kind of boomed. Um, 
you know, in 2019 for our Stonewall Day concert, which was the second one, we had Lady Gaga and Alicia Keys and Donatella Versace and Josephine Scriver and Alex Newell. I mean, it was insane. But that just told me people wanted to help us elevate that message, right? Hey, okay, we're going to like one day, we're all going to remember what happened. And so over the last seven years, Stonewall Day has trended six globally on social. We've been ranked the number one pride event. We've had everyone participate from President Obama to Katy Perry um, to Cynthia Erivo, who's our headliner for this year. So that became like our thing was the concert. I said, okay, well, this is good. It's a good life. I'm not going crazy. Uh, um, The concert's doing really well. And then um, as we get into this, I by chance went to a meeting six, seven years ago that included folks from the Obama administration and the National Park Service. And I was invited to that meeting by the National Parks Conservation Association, who we had just come to know each other. And that's when I found out that the Stonewall National Monument was in fact happening. But that kind of set the seed for the visitor center. But yeah, it's been it's been a bit of a whirlwind because when I started Pride Live, I'd never ever in a million years thought I would have a commercial lease. I'd be <laughs> who really wants that? who says, hey, my goal in life is to have a commercial lease. (laughs) Um, But the partnership with the MPS, which I I look forward to talking to you guys about, um, we're a part of that family. We are the urban queer member of that family. And I think that's really important that people recognize that families can come in all different shapes and sizes. And I think we represent that. So yeah, that's how, uh, that's a little bit of my background and how we started Pride Live. And and again, never did I think we would be here, but um, here we are and it's pretty amazing. It's incredible to just have a very simple mission to start just to help the community and then to see what grows from that just it sometimes you don't have to be so specific and it can be a very broad mission and then it opens up the world of possibilities and clearly that is exactly what happened here because again like you said you never dreamed that you'd be in this position at this point so that's an incredible just story of like prominence of how everything came to be and like what a testament to you, to the organization, and to like where things are headed with everything. I'm really taken by what you said regarding like we are the the queer urban member of the National Park Service. And chosen family is like, right? I mean, as queer people, we're no one without our chosen family. Our chosen family is, you know, what what lifts us up. And I feel and and Stonewall is represents so many things, but it is such like a a place to represent chosen family in particular, because I do feel like often because of the fact that queer people tend to gravitate towards cities and hubs and places like that, that that's where chosen family gets like sewn together from all over different places. And so like, I love how like the narrative of Stonewall is also like, the queer American narrative of just like the role of chosen family and also the role of urban spaces in queer history. I'm curious, what other kind of connections are you have you seen happen to uh, sort of elevate that part of the story, Pride Life's journey of heading into creating what will become the Stonewall um, Visitor Center? Well, it's interesting when you were talking about chosen family and gravitating towards urban spaces. One of the amazing individuals who we have come to be in a position to call him our friend and advisor and honored is Mark Siegel. So it's interesting because Mark is a Stonewall pioneer and he was there that night. And we can talk about like that, like people who were there because I getting involved in this I'm so not interested as much in as who was there that specific night because the movement was much bigger than that. So I was like, I used to be that person who was there that night. And I'm like, oh my God, why? Like the movement is, was, was so big, much bigger than that back then. But it's interesting because Mark, he tells a wonderful story of knowing he was gay, being very supported by his mother and his grandmother. But when he was 19, he got on the train and came to New York because he heard that's where we were. He was like, okay, I have to go where I will be a part of something. And so Mark Siegel at 19 came to New York, stayed at one of the, what was then a hostel, but then made his way to Christopher Street. I don't think a lot of that has changed over time. So when we talk about the urban spaces being magnets, and then Mark talks about being like enveloped by the community and that probably saving him, that he realized there were others like him. So for me, every time Mark tells that, or every time I'm privileged to be in his presence and he tells that story, it hits me again. 
because if you think about it, there weren't so many of the things that we have now. He couldn't just pick up his cell phone, his mobile phone and call someone. Like Mark was on his own, but he knew that that space might be a safe space for him. So I think Dustin Not A Lot has still changed. Stonewall is still this beacon that people just gravitate to. One of the other things I know about the essence of Stonewall is if something really great happens or something really bad happens, we just go there. No one has to send out an email. No one has to send out a text, right? And it's for what you said. It's for community. It's to feel like this essence of we are all together. There are others like us. I love that. Of all things, I probably love that most, what that represents. You just know to go there. So for us and this process, you know, deciding to do this, you guys, was really difficult. We can talk about that. Like there definitely were a lot of challenges. But once 51 opened up, and I think a lot of people in the community, I didn't even know back in the day that 51 was a part of the original bar. So uh, um, to once that lease opened up, like the last business I was in, there was a nail salon. And once they vacated, to me, it was like all the traffic went out of the way. I was like, well, this is just a sign that we have to do this, right? <laughs> like not thinking it through, just like, oh my God, 51 is open. And not only do we create the first LGBTQ visitor center, in the National Park Service there, but we take the other half of the bar back. And literally when one of the things when you guys come visit and others come see, one of the coolest things is, you know, we tried to, there's very direct messaging, but then there's subtle messaging. And in the floor, there's like this gray outline and everyone who goes through like, because the floor is very beautiful and bright and they say, hey, what's the gray outline? And we're like, that's where the bar, the physical bar used to be, like where people would saddle up and they stop. Like it takes you back, like you are already in the space. But then we're like, hey, this is where this was. And our theater is where the dance floor was. I think for us doing this might have been 50-50. But then when that space opened up, like when we talk about the significance of that, yeah, everything kind of became this very empty road of just green lights. I mean, I think the other thing I'll mention about that is... Once President Obama designated the Stonewall National Monument, you guys, um, the ceremony was scheduled. Pulse had happened a few weeks before. And so I think just the significance and the importance of safe spaces back then, where we were talking about 55 years ago, or even at that ceremony, just became, again, heightened for all of us. So yeah, for me, being able to do this in an urban setting is really important because it's also something different you don't expect. You don't expect to be able to go to a national monument from the subway in an urban setting. And now you get to go to a, like the, the monument is one thing. Now you have an official visitor center in all its gay glory um, in this very significant space. I think it was important. So everything that we faced, all the challenges at the end of the day was really worth it. It's again, it just is incredible. Like you said, this empty road of green lights, that things just kind of fell into place in a, in a very poetic sort of way. The idea of the visitor center being there, the inclusion of the footprint of the bar, you know, all of these things are such touch points for the story. And to be able to have that visitor center exactly where it is, is so integral to the story and integral to just the experience of being able to visit the monument and have that visitor center experience too. And so it seems like everything has been kind of set up in such a way that it really will allow people to understand not only what happened that night, but also just the experience of what that community was at that time, how that community has grown, and how that started to kind of catalyze a movement forward. Thanks very much. And I think one of the other things that, so I talked about the space, like right, not a lot of us knowing that 51 was the other half of the bar. I think the other thing that I've really, so as listen, as much as this is every day, there's 110 bad things to do. I'm still learning through this entire process more about Stonewall, more about our community, more about the history of our community. I think that's really important because we're still a community where our history is done by storytelling. So again, I'll, I'm going to reference Mark a couple of times because there's reading about history, there's seeing things about history, but then there's getting it firsthand from someone like Mark. And one of the things Mark said back in the day to all of us, he said, well, when you think about Stonewall, what are some of the names that you share? And everyone says, you know, Sylvia and Marcia, rightfully so. And then Mark goes down the list of seven or eight or nine, 10 other names. He goes, but nobody knows three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. 12. So this is our opportunity to really bring those names to the forefront and to celebrate 
celebrate all those other names. And I think that becomes really important because they're as much a part of our history as everyone else who we've recognized over time. And a lot of those folks like Sylvia and Marsha were really the others within our own community. And sometimes the stories of the others are not celebrated. So one of the things we did here was I said early on, I said, I don't want them mentioned. I want them celebrated. So again, when you guys come, there is a huge panel that is dedicated to this group. It is a very specific activation, but it is to expand our history. So people know that there were a lot more people involved and who they were and where they came from in those stories. So yeah, I think of all the things, you know, as again, I'll say challenging a number of times, but still being able to learn about our history myself is really quite exhilarating. And to do it at 58, so I think for us, when the younger generations come in, they'll have this information that they didn't have before. And so they don't have to start from the same square I started. I think that's maybe one of the coolest things is to really help people understand that the Stonewall history is actually much broader than they probably have ever thought. During the months of May and June, we are highlighting the work of LGBT plus outdoors in our community effort to showcase organizations who are working towards social justice, environmental action, and more inclusive public lands. LGBT plus outdoors mission is all about connecting members of the LGBTQ plus community through the outdoors, strengthening the ties of the community, and fostering a love of the outdoors while doing so. Along with creating community among queer outdoor adventure seekers, LGBT plus outdoors seeks to break down stereotypes and remove barriers for the LGBTQ plus community in what is traditionally a heteronormative outdoor industry. LGBT plus outdoors is committed to not only this, but sustainability practices in the outdoors, including environmental stewardship, inclusivity and accessibility, and collaborative partnerships. Make monthly charitable giving a trend in your life in 2024 and help to support LGBT plus outdoors this May and June. Visit the link in our Instagram bio for more information. Or go to www.lgbtoutdoors.com slash donation form. I'm so glad you mentioned the role of storytelling and just sort of like Stonewall, again, one of the many things it represents was sort of that idea of the gay bar at the time also serving as community center, gathering place, safe space, and that there are also many other gay bars in New York and other cities that did that. I remember when we both dived really into the LGBTQ heritage theme study published by the National Park Service under the Obama administration, we were like, we learn, oh my gosh. And like, we're two people who are like, love learning, love digging into history and It was just so incredible, like the amount of things like we had not even heard about. And like we were people who were like digging through and looking for it. That heritage theme study like brought out and went, hi, did you know about reminder days in Philadelphia? Did you know about, you know, like all of these things and something that I thought something that we really took away from that heritage theme study was how there were so many queer and gay liberation groups all over the country that all went Stonewall happened. And and that got some attention and we all need to gather together now because we all need to support and like help to allow this moment to highlight the work that we're all doing elsewhere. That's just like another thing that I was like, oh, and here at Stonewall acting as another beacon for all of these groups all over the country. No, I love that. And one of the um, other things that we do with what is our content wall, it's the West Wall that um, Mark Siegel helped us curate. So again, we tried to break up the content part of it into segments that really help people get a snapshot of what it was like back then. So we talk about, you know, the village being this enclave for the community, which it still is. We talk about the bar. We talk about, um, again, the folks uh, who were integral to the movement, like Stonewall, yes, but the movement back then. We talk about the impact and talk about Gay Liberation Front, the first organizations that came out of Stonewall. But one of the other things that is on our radar is a lot of things happened before Stonewall and they just didn't get the attention that Stonewall did. 
it is in no way to diminish anything about because we all know what Stonewall means to all of us. But what we want to do is celebrate those other events as well, because I think it's important for the people who live in those cities, who live in those areas to, yes, I definitely want to celebrate Stonewall. I want to go there one day, but maybe something happened in your town and maybe something happened that was never really acknowledged or celebrated. So there is a partnership that we have with Mark, via Mark Siegel with Visit Philadelphia. Visit Philadelphia is so cool. They're not only like, okay, we want you to come visit Philadelphia, but then we want you to go to all these other places. Um, so the crux of this partnership is to get people to come to the visitor center and to go visit Philadelphia and to explore the queer history there and to explore the queer history in New York, which are kind of, you know, no brainers. But then we want you to go to Southern towns and we want you to go to Pacific Northwest towns and towns that people normally don't go to and go visit and learn about their queer histories. Because that emboldens them, the local folks, that emboldens people to take action if they're there. But sometimes unless you kind of get that spark, you don't feel like you are compelled to engage. So I think one of the really cool things about, again, learning all the other names, Sylvia and Marcia, and then all the other names, but also all the other places that happened before and after Stonewall that maybe have just never gotten the recognition and to celebrate those places as well. Something that the National Park Service says all the time is that its role is as America's storyteller. That's what it defines itself as. And to me, I have always sort of, you know, when you're recreating outside or doing something outside, you act as a steward for that outdoor space and you help to do whatever you can to preserve it and keep it as safe for not only the other people, but all of the life that's there. And I feel similarly to that, I think the National Park Service too, this is such an example of how not only are we stewards of outdoor space, we are also stewards of American stories. Like we also have to be those stewards. And so I feel like that project that like emboldens people to visit other places, learn more is also in service of us being stewards to the stories that have created and shaped the lives we all have now. It's interesting. So Anne and I, my spouse, we are massive, massive National Park fans before this even became on our radar. And so a few years back, Anne and I and our two best friends, they live in London. Uh, they grew up in communist Czechoslovakia. Um, so we just flew into South Dakota, we rented a car and we drove for t 14 days to different national parks. And I knew we were doing this. I wasn't ready to tell everyone I went there that, hey, we're doing this, look at us. Um, but it was exciting quietly to sit like in front of old a faithful to be um, at Yosemite, to be at all these different parks, the Badlands, to be at all these different parks, and to know that we were doing this, and to sit beside people and say they don't know I'm part of their family yet. That was so amazingly cool, you guys. Um, I also realized, which wasn't a surprise to us, you know, the in that part of the country, the parks and the folks there weren't that diverse. Like Anne and I are two queer women of color. Um, a lot of times we were the only ones that we could know this. But again, I went in and at the time I happened to have a broken foot, so I couldn't walk as well as my traveling colleagues. So I would sit next to folks and I would just quietly know that this was happening. And I was really excited. I'm like, they don't even know that we're going to be part of this family. And I can't wait to announce this. And But yeah, as far as the storytelling part, especially in a part in a time you guys where two folks will see the same exact thing and take away two very different things, even though it's factual, like that car is red, maybe. Um, and it's like, everything is that way. And it's not really comfortable. But for us to tell the story is very important to be a part of the national parks. And to your point, Dustin, as you know, America's storytellers, I love that part of it. And I do feel that's another green light. Like we're storytellers for our community. And so this is all kind of aligning. And I think that's really cool. Absolutely. I feel like the the whole process here, and also just the idea of allowing Stonewall to sort of be this touch point for so many people, but also giving context in, you know, other past events and other events, you know, past Stonewall. It's such a great way to continue that role of being a storyteller and using the visitor center as a way to um, continue the education of others, um, to know that queer history, queer, you know, liberation all happened prior to Stonewall is continuing on today, not just, you know, not just here in New York, not just in the United States, across the world, you know, there is such a what an awesome role to be able to give to any visitor that's coming into that space to just 
actually having more than just this mention of Stonewall that you may have read about at some point in a history class somewhere. Like this is an immersive experience for people to be able to take away something that is bigger than them, um, whether they're queer or not, and allow them to kind of go forth with that information and hopefully continue to learn and continue to press on and be curious and be investigatory on their their own time um, to, to just continue to act as their own sort of educator. I think the other thing I'll mention here is I think when you think national parks, you know, you think family trips, uh, for sure. I know growing up, again, when you're really poor and young and brown and you know you're different you don't think the national parks are for you i always thought you had to have like a station wagon to go and we didn't have a station wagon um but i think for most of america when you think national parks are like family trip uh we're no different we want families to come to visit the stonewall national monument we want families to come visit the stonewall national monument visitor center we are no different from any of the other national parks or monuments or visitor centers in that regard this is a place where you can come learn about what happened there and it's part of american history it's not just lgbtq history we are a part of american history so it was interesting we were just on a call before uh with the wonderful folks from the npca and that's where we are constantly talking about that we are a destination for families So um, when people think about the national parks and they think about us, you know, that welcome for families should not be viewed any differently as if you were going to one of the parks in the Midwest. And I'm excited about that, that part to say, hey, this is a place where you can come. You know, you can go into the bar. You have to be a, like you have to be a certain age. I know. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I've ever gone down there where people aren't taking pictures and then they try and get into the bar. And I'm like, oh, they open at two. <laughs> Um, you know, um, and I'm like, can you hang around? Cause they open at two. Um, but then we'll be like, we open at 10 and then folks can come and they can check us out and spend some time and then go get lunch and then they can go to the bar. So it's kind of, you can spend a couple of hours down there instead of just, you know, going to the bar and having a drink, which is really cool. It creates a very unique and specific experience, you know, like the, especially because like Stonewall is still an operating bar. I remember it was my first gay bar. I was taken there by a friend of mine who I had just come out and he was like, and I was like, I haven't been to a gay bar yet. And he goes, well, then we have to go to the mother bar. And so that is that is where we went. And we did drag bingo that night. And it was so much fun. But I love that. Like, I remember being in there and feeling I was just like, I feel all of the history here. I feel everybody who's passed through here, you know, as I'm as I'm here. The energy is very special and very specific and unlike anywhere else. And so, like, I love now that the Visitor Center is there to provide so much context and so much you can really, like, understand, like, the energy and the the community around Stonewall and what it has to offer. So is the the Visitor Center is officially open now? So we're officially open on June 28th. It's the 55th anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion. Um, So that was our plan all along. When we first signed the lease in June of 2022, I knew that I wanted to open on the 55th anniversary. That's what I told our contractors, (laughs) um, which is always fun to have that conversation with them. And I remember for the ceremonial groundbreaking ceremony where... um, director of the NPS, Sam. So director Sam's was with us. So the backdrop was, of course, 51 Christopher, but we had put a window cling up and it said that we would be opening on June 28th of 2024. And every single person, even Anne, came up to me and said, you know, maybe you should put summer or June. And I said, no, if we're going to do this, we're going to open on June 28th. So yes, we are opening on June 28th, which is going to be amazing. This is incredible to have the space coming, especially during Pride Month, you know, especially, you know, on the anniversary. What should someone who maybe has no idea about Stonewall or very little idea about what Stonewall is or, you know, why the impact is there? What should they expect when they go to the visitor center? So I know what I have as my hopes for people who come visit Michael. And first and foremost, I've spoken about the content wall a couple of times. It's factual in such a way that it is direct from someone who was there. So it is a firsthand account of what happened. All the content that we have, because of course, as everything happens, when you sign a lease, the day after you walk into the space where you've signed the lease, it's much smaller than you remembered before you signed the lease. I'm like, wow, it's huge. And then I signed the lease. I'm like, it's not so big. So it's 2,100 square feet. So we tried to make the most of the 2,100 square feet. So that West wall in particular Michael, the content is all digestible content. 
And it literally working with Mark, there were panels where the content ran onto the floor, like, because there's so much of it, right? Especially when it came to the legacy, like, how do you knot that down? And so Mark and I are both visual people. And the fabricators kept saying, it's too much, it's too much, it's too much. And then they showed it to us and it would like run onto the floor. So what we did was we pitched, we picked a word from each sentence. And that's how we started to really break it down. So again, the panels that I mentioned before, we want everyone to kind of really have a good grasp of what happened, of what factually happened, the significance of the space, the people who were involved, the impact of Stonewall after we talk about the things that happened before Stonewall. Like, hey, there was a rev up to this. And these are some of the places maybe you've never read about. And here they are on this wall. So we want them to get, again, a grasp of Stonewall. Um, we want them to understand why we did this. So when you first walk in, there is kind of a bump out wall. And that's the why on why we took on this very historic and extremely stressful project. Top of the wall has a quote from President Obama's Stonewall National Monument Declaration. The bottom of the wall has the logos of our three partners, so the National National Park Service, National Parks Conservation Association, National Park Foundation. The middle part of that wall um, is very personal. Um, I'm a private person. My family is very private, but we are doing this for my uncle Tony. My family has served in the military for four generations. We are very proud of that. And my uncle Tony, who was a gay man, he served in combat in Vietnam and he came back very ill. And he was, you know, he wasn't a big guy. He was maybe like five, seven and 130 pounds. But even though he came back ill, he felt he could still serve. So he went to work at the Veterans Administration on 23rd Street. And he was just like that amazing guy. You know, I remember a young couple in his building got married and they didn't have any money. So he put a, he put a refrigerator for them on his Sears cart. Like that's the type of guy my uncle Tony was. And he was like a deacon in his church. And then when he got very ill and he died of AIDS no one from the hot no one from the veterans administration and no one from his military unit came to his funeral and I remember it gutted my mother and it gutted all of us so when my mom passed the flag that was on my uncle's casket was uh, the family gave it to me um so I've been holding it for a while and then when we decided we would do this um I did speak to my family I still have three members of my family who have served in the military so we all agreed that my uncle Tony's flag would be on display uh at that wall so as you guys know, my Uncle Tony was one of that generation lost to AIDS, not just AIDS, to indifference. So with permission from my family, yeah, his flag is going to be in that wall right under President Obama's quote. And what we hope it does is it just um, that it will have people, Michael, just take a second. Um, so Stonewall is one thing. When we talk about what happened after Stonewall, the AIDS crisis was what happened after Stonewall in that very area. So we want them to remember that. I wanted to share that story with you all so that, Michael, to, to get a snapshot and a good grasp of what happened at Stonewall. Understand why we did this, the personal sacrifice, not of me, but of my family, like my Uncle Tony. And hopefully to go through the rest of it, there are a lot of amazing exhibits, a lot of amazing activations. That's how we represent our founding partners. We said to them, hey, you can't do logos but you can do amazing activations. And then when they're done walking through the space, Michael, we want them to feel compelled to take action. We want them to be so moved that they say, if I'm not doing something, let me start. If I'm doing something, let me do more. One of the really cool activations that I'll share with you guys is, is that there's a famous photo of the jukebox and the cigarette machine that were beaten up really in bad shape. So we were able to identify the make and model of the jukebox. Uh, it's a 1967 row AMI. We have three of them. When you come in, you get to roll up to the jukebox and put a token in and play vinyl. That's an Amazon music activation. So what we did with our founding partners, we said, we really need you guys to be creative. Like I can't do your logos. <laughs> um, so what can we do that makes sense? And I talked about the panels. So one of the panels is we know what Stonewall looked like, but what did Stonewall sound like? So the music in there hopefully is a, is a representation of that. But yeah, with every inch, Michael, we tried to be as creative as we could with the, the storytelling, the representation of our partners who paid for all of this. And to keep in mind that, you know, I'm a museum geek. I'll go into a museum. I'll be there for four or five hours. And then there's folks who are just going to zip through it. But even if they zip through it, they'll at least be able to get kind of a feel for what we tried to create. You're talking to two other museum geeks, <laughs> Diana. Oh, we're horrible. Oh, Ann and I went on an Olivia cruise once. One of the stops was Elba. And so we, of course, had done all our research on, on Napoleon, his home. And do you know we were the only two people who got off the boat at Elba? Everyone else stayed on. We like <laughs> ran off the boat. We couldn't wait to get there. We're only, anyway, yes. So to the geeks on the call, much power, <laughs> love it. much respect. Love it. Love it. <laughs> That's right. Love it. I love that because I'm so excited to know that 
all of the activations in the visitor center were started from a place of like, I'm a museum geek who loves to interact and loves to take in. The, there's so much opportunity in a museum to like make something so fun and give you an experience you actually can't get anywhere else. And so like, I'm so excited to hear that that's what's going on in there. I mean, we tried to be as creative as we possibly could. And the good thing is I've been doing this a really long time and there have been times I haven't had the best of partners, but all the partners who are founding partners, so Mellon Foundation and Google and JP Morgan Chase and Michael Kors and Lance and Booking.com, they have all been very much a part of this and very invested. And what we say to them is this is your opportunity to show everyone what Stonewall means to you and how you want to represent your brand within this community and within this very significant space. And I hope I get people to stay really along. I know it's only 2,100 square feet, um, but we had some experts come through like who do museums and visitor centers. And I remember I explained to them and they said, okay, Diana, we think on average people will spend seven minutes in your space and I wanted to cry. And I said, what do you mean they're not going to be here for an hour? So I've always kept that in the back of my mind, like how can I keep them here longer? So hopefully that's what we've done. I'm sure we'll be in there for much longer than seven minutes. <laughs> Good. Good. I look forward to it. So this is an extremely significant moment in the history of just not only Stonewall, but also like queer history of America, like the opening of this, what it means, like as in this, I, I feel like will be, this will be in the textbooks. What does that mean for you, your chosen family members? And also like, what do you hope that creates in the future for other moments that will end up on the queer history timeline? I mean, I think... What I would hope is, so the way I think the world works, as we know the world, two queer women of color should never have been leading an effort like this. It just is not something I think that anyone would have ever imagined, let alone us. So I hope as being the first that we encourage people, listen, New York, we have a lot of wind behind our backs. As difficult as it was, you guys, when you have Stonewall, that type of wind behind your back is extremely powerful. Not everyone will have that. And some of the smaller towns that we talked about, that won't even exist. So to be able to step up, to take action, to even the smallest action can have repercussion, or can have some type of ripple effect. So I hope that first and foremost, we inspire that, like that you come here and say, I can do this where I live. Uh, it'll be tough, but I can do it where I live. I think secondly, to pay homage to so many more that came before us, like a lot of us know a lot of names, but there's so many more. So to pay homage to all of those, to give those folks their due, to pay homage to our legacy, to encourage people that they need to understand the power of accurate storytelling. And to, again, we have this pledge of ours in the window. And it says, in the name of those who came before me, I pledge to be brave, to be true to myself, and to fight like hell for equality. Of all things, that second line is most important, to be brave and to be true to myself. So I think if we can inspire that, that would be all, all the stress, you guys, everything would be well worth it. Just that we officially open to the public on June 28th. And then later that evening, just because we haven't challenged ourselves enough, it is our Stonewall Day concert. And that's over Hudson Yards. And we just went public today that Cynthia Revo is headlining. That is a free concert. So thank you to our sponsors, Hudson Yards and Google and Booking.com and Win who in a time when concerts are super expensive, <laughs> you can go to a free concert for Pride. And just that if you can't come visit, please know that we are working on a virtual component to the Visitor Center, an app. So even if you can never come to New York, you know, those smaller cities that we've talked about, those kind of quieter places, we are going to develop this app where you can experience the Visitor Center as if you were there. And hopefully we would be able to impact you in the same way. But at the end of the day, I'm just very proud of the team. I'm so proud to be in partnership with the National Park Service and to be, listen, we've said this a couple of times, we are the very gay cousin of the National Park Service and we are going to celebrate that because family can be different and we just want people to understand that. And sometimes it's important for them to see it. So you can see that at the Visitor Center. This has been Gaze at the National
Parks, the podcast, and we're here to remind you to hike early and hike often and that adventure is always out there. Gaze at the National Parks was created and is hosted by us, Dustin Ballard and Michael Ryan. To see images from this episode, follow our Instagram at gaze at the National Parks. To contact us, email us at gaze at the National Parks at gmail.com. And to find out more about the parks visited on this show, visit our website, gaze at the National Parks.com. And that's gaze, G A Z E. All original artwork featured on Instagram, on our website, and in the Gaze Shop is by me, Michael Ryan. All original music was written and performed by Dave Seaman and Mariella Klinger with Sean Sklios on guitar. This episode was edited by me, Dustin Ballard. We would also like to acknowledge that while recording this episode that we are on the traditional and stolen lands of the Lenape people, also known as Ocean County, New Jersey.